I was sitting around trying to figure out what to do in the next podcast. I have a lot of thoughts in my mind. And even honestly, tonight, as I was doing devotion with my son, I mean, what, what should I talk about? Well, we can always talk about God. <laughs> I mean, there's so much to learn about God. Do you know that we'll be learning more about God for all eternity? Now, we know some attributes of God, that God is holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's faithful. We know some of it, but you know what? We will know more and more and more and be more enthralled and more captivated. Some people think heaven's going to be boring where you just sit up in clouds. No, that's fictional. And the thing is, I think a lot of us have a fictional view of heaven, but we also have a fictional view of God. It's been said that God made man his own image and man then returned the favor. You get that? That God made us in his own image. It says it in, in Genesis chapter one, verse 27. However, we turned around and made God in our own image and we have our own God. So in this podcast episode, I want to talk about this idea. Are you worshiping the true God? Is your God the God of the Bible? Is your God the God that has revealed himself through creation, through his word and through his son? Or do we have a God, an idol of a God that we call God, but it's not God as he revealed himself? Yep. That's what we're talking about in this episode of Connecting Faith and Life. Hey, thanks for joining me for this edition of Connecting Faith in Life. I really do appreciate it. I say it every week. I appreciate you guys taking time to listen to what I have to say. Who am I, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for it. And as I preached on Sunday at my church two weeks ago, I kind of talked about that idea that God has been so faithful to me. Uh, I, I don't deserve anything, but God is so faithful. And I'm going to talk more about that in a future episode. And if you want to watch that whole my whole message, it's up to you. Go for it. I'll put a link in the description. But I did talked about that in that sermon. I talked about God, and we started with God and what our view of God is. And so I want to just use this episode and just talk about God. I mean, it's so, that, that, that's a small subject, right? And that's a huge subject, unless we have a God that's too small. There's a book written by this guy. I think it's on my bookshelf. It asks the question, is your God too small? And I think the idea is not if God is small, but is your God, the God that you have in your mind, too small? And I think we have these, these wrong view of God, views of God, based on what we think and what we do. And I think it's kind of the same way we do with celebrities in, in, in a certain way. And I don't want to put celebrities and God on the same level by any means. But if you think about it, we watch these celebrities, whether they're athletes or movie actors or whatever, we watch them from a screen and we assume they're they're kind people based on their character. We assume the, the, the good stuff about them because, you know, if they have a good PR person, they could do good marketing, right? And I was talking to somebody the other day about this idea that the more and more I hear with social media and I hear more about these athletes and their views on things and the way they can, it's hard to kind of root for them sometimes. It's kind of hard to be in their corners. You're like, that's what they're like in real life? What I, I it's, it, it becomes harder for me because it's like, would I even be a friend with that person? <laughs> you know, would I cheer that person on? I don't know. But it's because we have this false view of them based on what we think they're like. And a lot of times we superimpose our views of what we think they should be like and what our values on them and come to find out that's not what it is. Well, I think in a much worse way, greater way, I don't know how to say this, but we do the same thing about God. We take our views of what we think God should be like, things God should do and God would do or wouldn't do, and we superimpose that on God. And that's not God. That's not the God of the Bible. That becomes an idol. That's our own idol of God and not the God of the Bible. So today I wanted to give a couple passages that really help me see God in a new way. And I kind of share this in, in my, my message, but... You know, I went through the season where I was really seeking God. I, I got tired of just going through the motions at, at church and, you know, trying to live in the world because I was discipled by the world. I mean, I wasn't the church, but I was discipled by the world. What was tr truth and factual, what mattered was what happened Sunday afternoon through Saturday night. And Sunday was just, hey, we went to church, we did, did this thing to God, but it wasn't really my life. I was talk, joking about how I got discipled by Snoop Dogg and Easy e and all these rappers and, and comedians and sitcom hosts and movie stars. That's who discipled me because that's what I was listening to on a daily basis. I would listen to the Bible maybe on Sunday if I paid attention during service and sometimes, you know, youth group and all that. But even at that, when I went to youth group, I was going for the girls. I was like, look at the girls. You know what I'm saying? If you out there, if you're married, don't, don't look at your wife too hard, you know, because you feel guilty. But that was my reality. And so in my early 20s, after I had my, my first daughter, um, I was like, man, it's got to be more than this, you know. 
And uh, God used uh, Amway <laughs> uh, to get me to listen to business tapes and CD and tapes, tapes back then. It was cassette tapes before I got to the CDs. But then from that, I started listening to sermons and, you know, Charles Stanley, Chuck Swindoll, J. Vernon McGee, Tony Depp. I started listening to these preachers and I was starting to understand and have a deeper hunger for the things of God. And I remember I would get up like at four o'clock in the morning because I worked at FedEx for a while, but then I switched jobs and I was still just kind of wired that way. I get up early in the morning and I would spend like four hours in the Bible um, just seeking God. And one day I got so frustrated with God because I was doing my best and I was trying to understand everything about God, but I could not fit everything about God in my head until I realized that's a good thing. Because if I could fit everything about God in my head, I would be God, right? And so I want to share with you some passages that really kind of helped me to start to see God and, and, and to rightly see God. As a matter of fact, let me give you a quote. A.W. Tozer has a book called The Knowledge of the Holy. It's a very small book, one of my favorite books because it's really small, but it's so compact. It has so much good stuff in it. I find myself underlining chapters at a time. But he says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Whether you agree or disagree with that, it's, I think it's some truth there that, that when I think about God, will dictate how I live my life. It did when I was a kid because I thought God was this mean man in the sky wanting to step on me if I did something wrong. Or I thought he was a big Santa Claus in the sky giving me everything I wanted. So I had both those views and they were very extreme views. Matter of fact, I have a series I do called Caricatures of God where we distort God. We, 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 we take some truth about him and we kind of distort it like they do with those pictures, right? And I think I did the same thing with God. I think we, we often do that. And A.W. Tozer goes in his book and says a lot of things, but one of the favorite things he says to, is this. He says, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. He says to, to purify and elevate our concept of God. And I think we have to do that through the scriptures. How has God revealed himself to us? He's real, revealed himself to creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, it says in Psalm 19. But also God, cre he revealed us through his word, that, that through God's word, we can know more about God. And through his son, Jesus Christ, we can know him intimately because Jesus is the exact representation of God, it says in Hebrews. So when I think about this, I'm going to give several passages right now. I'm going to read several passages that really just really helped me, helped me over the years to really start to see God rightly. And I want to continue to see God. I want to continue to grow in my knowledge and truth of who God is, and how God revealed himself. And the first one is in Exodus chapter 34. And this is going to be one of our memory verses for our kids coming up soon. And this is the story when Moses was taking the tablets back up to God. He was going to get some, he already broken the tablets. He was upset. God was going to give him some new Ten Commandments, two tablets. So I'm going to start reading verse, uh, verse one. Exodus 34 says this. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. And present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose up early. He rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hands two tablets of stone. This is where God says something about himself. It's one thing if I would describe someone to you, but when they describe themselves to you, I think that has more weight because they're, especially well, if they're human, we can be self-deceived, but God's not self-deceived. God knows himself intimately. So God's, God here begins to declare who he was to Moses. Look what he says. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children of the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please 
Let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sins, and take us for your inheritance. So in the, the situation here, God reveals himself to Moses and says something about himself. What do he say? He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God says something about himself that he is gracious, that he's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God reveals himself to Moses and tells him what he's like. And we can see those attributes of God. God is so gracious. Gracious is God not giving us what we deserve. Merciful, he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Like we deserve damnation and hell forever. But his mercy, um, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he saved us. We're saved by his mercy that he does not give us what we deserve. Reminds me of that game we played, you know, you somebody's hand like this. If you're watching and you, you kind of try to bend that person's hand over, they say mercy and you stop. You didn't deserve it, but they stop when, when you ask for mercy. God gives us mercy. He's so gracious. He gives what we don't deserve. He's slow to anger. And honestly, that kind of bothers me sometimes because I want other people to get their just due, just not me. I want just for everybody else, like when I'm driving. Driving, you know, down the freeway, minding my business, and all of a sudden somebody fly by me. I'm doing 70 because the speed limit is 70, and they're doing like 100. And I'm like, where you at, cops? Get, get, get him. Get her. Because I want justice, right? But God is slow to anger, and I'm grateful. The Bible says in Romans that the, the goodness of God leads us to repentance, that God is so patient and slow to anger with us. Now, it doesn't mean he won't be angry. It doesn't mean he does not judge. God is, 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 is faithful. He's just. But God is also, the Bible says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of angry God. And you look through the Old Testament and New Testament. God judged people when they outright rebelled, and he has that right. God will be glorified through the salvation of people, but also the damnation of people who rebel against him. God will be glorified in both. But I'm so gracious. I'm so grateful that he's slow to anger. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. One of my favorite verses is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses uh, 13, where it says, When we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And I, I've experienced that in my life where God has been so faithful to me in my life. And it's just so amazing. So that's what God says about himself. And in, in my journey, I started reading passages like that and also passages like Isaiah chapter 40. If you're watching on the internet or watching this podcast on YouTube or on our app, um, you can see this app I have. It's called Olive Tree, and I've talked about it before. I probably need to do a new video on it because they've made so many updates, and I keep adding different commentaries and things to it because this app has just been like, man, this is like my Bible Bible. Like back in the day, I had several Bibles that I always keep with me, but you know, I don't keep up with stuff that well anymore, and I just like it because I have so many things in here, so many resources, so many, you know, I buy Bible dictionaries, I buy commentaries to read. But uh, it's a great app. I really like it. And I've been had it for 10 years. And I like the fact that I have it on all my devices. It's on my iPhone. It's on my iPad. It's on my computers. You know, one at home, a laptop. So when I'm traveling, I can just get into the Word of God. So anyway, uh, I remember reading Isaiah chapter 40. And I, don't know, I didn't know much about prophecy back then. But this right here just describes God in a way that just blew my mind. Look at what it says here in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Speaking, this is Isaiah speaking of God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with the span. Like, that, look at that question. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Like, his hand can measure all the waters. He enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the, weigh the mountains in the scales and heels in a balance. Like, God does all of this. Verse 13. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man has showed him his counsel? Who counsels God? Who tells God what to do and what not to do? Or or who does God seek? He's going to talk about that more. Matter of fact, verse 14, he says it right here. Who did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice or and taught him knowledge or showed him the way of understanding? The answer is clear. No one. <laughs> there is none like God. And so I, as I started reading these kind of passages and kind of blowing my mind how massive God is and how big God is. We sing the song, my God is so great, so strong and so mighty, right? But that doesn't, it pales in comparison to this. Look at verse 15. And this one really got me. Verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop in, from a bucket and are counted as dust on a scales, on scales. Behold, he takes up the coastland like a fine dust, like the fine dust, 
Lebanon is not sufficient for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for burnt offering. Verse 17, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness compares with him? An idol? <laughs> he kind of laughs. An idol? A craftsman craft, craft, <laughs> cast it. I'm sorry. A craftsman cast it. That's a tongue twister. And a goldsmith overlays it with gold and cast for it silver chains. He who is impoverished, too impoverished for an offering, chooses wood that it will not rot. He seeks out skillful craftsmen to set it on an idol that it will not move. So he's, he's given this comparison like, who can you compare? The idols that you make, these little, these little images you make, and you have to make them. So you make your own God is what he's saying. <laughs> like, there's no comparison to this God that we serve. There's no, no comparison. You make it. And think about the gods that we serve, cars, houses, finance, money. You know, I think it was Jim Carrey that said he wishes everybody got everything they ever wanted just to find out it will never make them happy. Because I believe this. Oh, let me find this quote. I, I, I butchered it before when I was at church last Sunday or two Sundays ago. Um, it's attributed to St. Augustine. He said this, our hearts are restless until we rest in you. That's not the actual quote, but that's the idea that, oh, we, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Something that that effect. Right. So we're made by God. And so the idea that we would make an idol and try to find happiness in that is, is, is crazy because the Bible even talks about the fact that, that that we were made by God and for God. Colossians chapter one, verse 16, that we're made by God and for God and we will never find happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, pleasure, true pleasure. And anything but God, we were made by him and for him. And so the idea that we would make these idols to, to, to make us happy is crazy. But again, Isaiah is just talking to these people, uh, just exposing how awesome God is. Look at verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth emptiness? Man, this is God. And I, I, I don't know the whole context of this, but it sounds like the people are rebelling and trying to be their own God, like the, the, the all Old Testament and New Testament. And even now we rebel against God. We want to be our own gods. But Isaiah is setting them straight. This is God. He sits on the circle of the earth. So, so that passage kind of rocked me. But then I came across some, some passages in Job that really got me as well. And really looking at the awesomeness of God and who God is. If you know the story of Job, Job um, was, you know, had all he trusted God. And he went through this whole series where he lost everything. His friends came to talk to him, try to give him counsel. And at one point, Job just got upset with God and began to question God. And then God started questioning Job. And at that point, I wouldn't want to be Job <laughs> um, questioning God. And you can read that uh, Job 38 um, through 40. Actually, God gives these like these two speeches or rebuttals or whatever, just kind of shuts them down, does these mic drops on Job. But I love what it says in first 38. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, now, 37, 38. Let me see. 35. Yeah, 30. Well, I'll just start at 34. And this is God asking Job and basically questioning Job about the fact that, are you God or am I God? Verse 34 says this, can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the in inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when it dust runs into the mass and the clouds stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for lions or satisfy the appetite of young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie and wait in the thicket? Who provides for the ravens his prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? He goes on and on and on. And God is just questioning Job about, can you do these things that I do? 
No. In other words, I'm God and you're not. And I think sometime I think I'm God. I'm in control. Um, until I get sick, I get a little sniffle. I can't even handle that. Right? <laughs> but yet I got everything under control. No, God does. And, and, and when, when he talks about the lions, matter of fact, Psalm 104, he, he asked the same question. The psalmist says, uh, the, the lions, it says, the lions roar, yet they seek their prey from God. Psalm 104. If you're watching this on YouTube and you see me going through the app and looking at all these things, looking up, looking also on, on the, hey, stop that. Um, Psalm 104. Uh, what verse is that? I think it's around 20 something. Here we go. Uh, there's so many things in here. Look at verse 24. I want to make sure I miss it. Here it is. Verse 19. He made the moons to mark off the season. Speaking of God, the sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. When all the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to work and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of creatures. And so he goes on and on and on. So read Psalm 104. And I guess my whole point in this, this podcast, when we talk about connecting faith and life, are we living the life that God has given to us? Do we see God as he really is? As A.W. Tozer said, we need to purify and elevate our, our thoughts of God, or who God really is. We, let me get that quote. I'm going to quote it right. What do he say? Yeah, he says, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian among the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. To purify and elevate our concept of who God is. And it has to be based on the scriptures, not our own mind, not our own doing. So I want to challenge all of us to get into the word of God, to know God more, to seek God, to, to, to know who he really is and not making up our own idols in our own mind. And let me even challenge you with this. I think sometimes we love to quote unquote worship. We love to sing. We, we've equated the worship and, and singing as one. Worship is all of our lives. And it's not a condemnation, a negative thing. But I just often see how we will come to church and do all the singing. But when it comes to hearing the word of God, we're out. Peace. I was like that growing up. Sang in the choir, played the drums. When it's time to hear the word of God, didn't have time for that. And, and it's, it's funny because I was sharing my story and the idea that I, you know, in my in that time I was seeking God and God was working in my life and just changing me. I just got rid of all my secular music and I was sharing this church. I would listen to gospel music, listen to Christian music, and that's to this day. And so Sunday, uh, this Sunday, two two weeks after I spoke, a lady came up to me. She's like, "Thank you." She said, "I've been listening to gospel music all week long, and it really has changed my mindset." I said, "Isn't it awesome to be driving and hearing the things of God versus hearing some pagan Babylon about something who knows what?" And just driving, listening to the word of God, listening to the truth of God being sung over you and, and drawing you closer to God. I think that's so amazing. And so I just want to challenge us to get into the word of God, um, to know this God, to know the God that we say we sing to, that, that the, even our singing and worship is not about us, it's about him. You know, people say, I remember uh, a president of a big Bible college said, you know, every year these kids come into the Bible college, their knowledge of God is less and less. They're, they're ignorant about the things of God. But this is a generation that loves to worship God. And when he said that, I thought to myself, how can we worship someone we don't know? And so it is our responsibility. And listen, it is our joy. It is our joy to seek and to know God, to purify and elevate our concept of who God really is. Because he is, it's a pleasure to know God. It is, well, I've been made by God and for God and to draw close to him. Again, our hearts are restless. We wrestle, we rest, we don't have much rest. And that rest and that joy and that satisfaction will only be found in God. So my challenge to you, challenge to me, I'll take him A.W. Tozer, to, to purify and elevate our concept of God, to seek God, to know God. And the truth is, God's not hiding. He wants to be found. He wants us to know him. And what a joy, what a privilege to know God more and more, to practice the presence of God. But to do that, we must know him and seek him how he has revealed himself to us. Because I think that's one of the best ways to connect this faith and this life by knowing the God who's given us both the faith, drawing us to himself, and the life and the lungs we breathe. 
So with that said, hey, thank you for joining me. If you like these podcasts, let us know. If you've got a topic you want me to talk about, let me know. Uh, if you want to be a guest on the show, uh, let me know. Maybe I, I have some guests sometime. I love to talk and chop it up. I think we need to do more talking about the things of God. And so with that said, check out our website, ProclaimMinistries.com. If you want to give, ProclaimMinistries.com slash give. Download the app. And next time, oh, uh, join us for the next episode of Connecting Faith and Life. I ended that kind of abruptly and kind of weird because I was looking at the clock here and I got like 27 minutes. I've been going a long time. I got... I'm trying to keep under half hours. Anyway, <laughs> hope you enjoy these podcasts. Hopefully they're helpful for you to live for God by connecting faith and life. Till next time. Peace. Peace.